It's a real privilege to be here. I feel a little conflicted about whether or not I should stand up here or sit there with you. So uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. And I am very excited to share with you a little bit about what I think is interesting in neuroscience and a little bit about what I think will be interesting in the years and decades to come. So first, I want to introduce you to a model organism. And this is a model organism that you are all presumably familiar with. You may have one or two of them at home, or you may know somebody that has one or two of them at home. And what I like about this video is that it illustrates how we come out as a blank slate. So this little creature presumably is sensing things from the world around her, but she really doesn't know what to make of it. She doesn't know how to execute any actions. And you know her cognitive abilities are pretty minimal. Now, if you fast forward a year and a half into this little creature's life, you will observe a radical transformation. So now she has been observing the world around her. <laughs> she maybe has picked up one or two things from somebody that she watches on a regular basis. So she has. Um, she has sensory perception. She's able to attend to things that are salient. She's able to execute motor programs, um, some of which she does better than others. So you can see she had a field day with the Kleenexes here. Uh, um, and also, at this point, she has a little bit more um, cognitive development. So still no empathy, but she at least has um, emotions that drive her behavior. And so as a, as a neuroscientist, I'm really interested, and neurobiologists in general, are very interested in understanding the circuitry that underlies perception, um, action, and cognition. And so I am, of course, not the only person interested in this. There are a huge number of people, um, including our President Obama, who back in 2013-ish, 2012, um, announced his intention to uh, have a, a national brain initiative. This was very important for me because his announcement happened right around the same time that I started my faculty position. And so in addition to starting my lab, I was able to capture this wave of enthusiasm or ride this wave of enthusiasm um, for trying to sort out how the wires in the brain actually allow us to sense, to act, and to um, have cognition. At UCSD, as Pradeep mentioned, we are particularly lucky. And we are lucky because when the Brain Initiative first kicked off, um, Pradeep was there along with our illustrious Nick Spitzer in the neurobiology um, uh, section, who many of you may know, um, as well as, Ra as Ralph Greenspan. And what Pradeep decided was that we need to have a center for brain activity mapping at UC San Diego. We need to not just follow the brain initiative, but we need to have our own initiative. And so um, the project that I'm going to tell you a little bit about today received seed, seed funding from the Center for Brain Activity Mapping. Um, and I hope you will see that this is going to propel our research in, a, in new and exciting directions. In my lab, we are interested in using all of the power of electrophysiology, molecular biology, and optical techniques to try to understand how the brain works. And we narrow down this massive question by focusing on a particular perspective, which is how does the experience of an animal shape the circuitry? And specifically, how does the experience of an animal shape neural circuitry by regulating the genome? So as many of you may be familiar with, the genome sits in the nucleus. The genome is made up of nucleotides. It encodes um, all of the infrastructure that makes up our cells, so it encodes proteins. These proteins then um, determine the identity of the cell and the identity of the tissue. Now in neurons, once a cell differentiates and becomes a neuron, its use of the genome is not, is not done or it's not um, completed. So neurons continue to use the genome in an ongoing and dynamic way um, that depends on the activity of those specific neurons. And so here I'm showing you a video of a piece of cortex. And this piece of cortex is not from the model organism I started with, but this is from a mouse. And what you can see is all of these little circles, which are the cell bodies of neurons, 
and they're, they're flashing. And the reason why they're flashing is because they are expressing a protein that fluoresces green when there's calcium in the cell. And the cell, um, calcium go, floods into the cell when the neuron fires an action potential. And so basically, every time you see one of these little green flashes, that neuron is firing an action potential. And so we can image swaths of cortex, and we can look at the activity of all of the neurons in that swath of cortex by looking at the patterns of these flashes. So these patterns of flashes encode information, but they also generate signals that change how genes are expressed in those cells. And the value of this changing, this, these changes in gene expression are manifest by all of the myriad disorders that can emerge when um, this process goes awry. So if you have um, dysregulation of the genome, you can wind up with very um, debilitating disorders such as autism, schizophrenia, epilepsy, and so on. So in my lab, what we're trying to do is build reporters of transcription so that we can visualize regulation of, genome, of the genome in parallel to visualizing the activity of the neurons. And in this way, we hope to be able to understand how activity regulates genes and how the genes feed back to the activity. We're building a fluorescent reporter of um, gene expression with money that was um, provided to the lab by the Center for Brain Activity Mapping. So here I'm showing you a cartoon of a piece of DNA, and this should be um, relatively familiar to each of you. Um, and so on this piece of DNA, you see this big glob. And this glob represents a protein that would bind DNA and regulate how genes are expressed. So what we are doing in collaboration with Jeffrey Chang's lab at the School of Pharmacology is we are generating nanobodies that recognize proteins that um, regulate the genome. So these nanobodies are um, quite special because every animal has an immune system. Um, but some animals have an immune system where they make very, very small antibodies. And the camel is one of them. So camels make small antibodies. And then we can use these. We can evolve these to recognize proteins that bind the genome. We can then fuse a fluorescent protein to this um, nanobody that recognizes our DNA binding protein. Um, and this fluorescent protein is something that has been derivatized so that you can now make them into many, many different colors. So we can have a library of different fluorescent molecules um, tethered to these nanobodies that recognize different proteins that bind the genome. So then this whole packet can be genetically encoded, much like the fluorescent reporter of calcium that I showed you in the earlier video, and can be superimposed into the same system. And so our goal then is be, to be able to image the activity of neurons in a mouse that's perform, or in an animal that's performing a task, and simultaneously image, visualize the activity of the cells, but also these waves of gene regulation that happen in parallel. And so our hope is that as the next couple of years unfold and we, um, we develop these tools that allow us to, to visualize activity at many stages, um, we'll be able to better understand how an animal's experience um, and its neuronal activity interact to, um, to generate the sophisticated repertoire of behaviors that animals have. And so I'd just like to leave you with this image of um, an artistic rendering of a piece of cortex um, where you can see all of these individual neurons connected together in this intricate circuit um, reminiscent of the circuit you might have in a computer. And I just want to point out the fact that the connections between these neurons are not static, but they're very dynamic. And their, di their, dynamic, um, their dynamics are dictated by the rules that are imposed by the genome. Um, yeah. And I'll just stop there. <laughs>